Welcome everyone to Indiana Black Expos, PPP loans, CARES Act funds, and loan forgiveness webinar. My name is John Thompson, and I will be your moderator for today. Let me begin by you know, giving you a little bit of background on myself. I own four companies, Thompson Distribution, First Electric Supply, CMID, which is engineering design firm, and BC Countertops. All four of those companies successfully applied for and received PPP loans. And um, I will add at this time that I was a panelist on an earlier webinar by Indiana Black Expo in April and had already successfully applied for my PPP loans learned so much on the panel, I withdrew my application and resubmitted it, even though I had been approved because I had missed some things that provided additional funding. So I encourage you all to be, pay very close attention today because we have an excellent lineup of panelists and they will really provide you with worthwhile information. One, there's still PPP money left and how to apply for it. And, uh, and you want to, to do that uh, um, if, if you're eligible and you'll learn those things today. So pay close attention, ask questions. There'll be an opportunity for that. And I'll take you through, through that here now with my housekeeping rules. So, um, so let's go through those rules. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A box and we will get to as many of these questions as we can at the end of this session. And there's also a way to, in, in, you know, to highlight a question that's already been asked as one that you have, that'll help that question move to the top of the, of the list so we can get that question answered first since there are many people who, who have an interest in, in, in the response to that question. And then also, remember to complete the session survey. Your answers will help with planning for next year's conference. And also, while I'm going through this, there are some poll questions up there on your screen. So while I'm going through these kind of highlights, please answer the very quickly those uh, poll questions. Uh, they help us immensely uh, in our work. And then uh, you'll complete the session survey at the end, and then uh, uh, and you'll see you'll have an opportunity to do that at the end. So, what I'm going to do now is go through and introduce our uh, three uh, excellent panelists, and uh, so let me read a little bit about their uh, background. First panelist I'll introduce you to is Dan Drexler. Dan serves as the regional director of the Central Indiana Small Business Development Center, which is hosted by Butler University's, their, their Lacey School of Business, in partnership with the Small Business Administration and the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. And I'll just highlight here now for you uh, if you are a business owner, uh, ISBDC, the Indiana Small Business Development Center, provide a wealth of services for you. So you certainly want to pay attention to that here, but also for other needs that you might have in terms of strategic planning, marketing, all kinds of services at no cost. And they are excellent services. Prior to joining ISBDC earlier this year, Dan spent 20 years in private industry, most recently a senior vice president with an Indiana manufacturer of industrial HVAC systems. He has previously worked with the Indiana and US Department of Commerce, primarily focused on export marketing and business counseling. As both a director in a small business company and a counselor to businesses, Dan is uniquely positioned 
to understand small business client needs from a hands-on perspective. And um, I'd also like to today introduce uh, another exciting panelist, Michelle Galligan. If it's true that everyone has a superpower, Michelle's is knowing and helping entrepreneurs. The energy, excitement, and challenges are what she loves, and working with others to make their dreams become a reality is the real buzz. The idea behind Keep Financials, her joint venture with GVQ, was to provide service to entrepreneurs and free them from the drudge of bookkeeping to spend their time creating, growing, and refining their ideas. And let me tell you, when you start a business, you oftentimes put off the bookkeeping, the record keeping, the accounting, and you say, well, I'll do that later. And it gets behind months and months. And you know, you think you're doing that to report to others, but that's how you manage your business. You need to know your balance sheet like the back of your hand. I know the balance sheet of all four of my companies, how much cash I have, receivables, inventory. I know it. what my cash flow is. I know and understand that the cash balance in my bank accounts, I know that today what checks are clearing. I know all of that. So if you don't have a, a resource within your company to do that, then you want to outsource that and get it done in a timely fashion so that it can provide you with the information you need to run your business. Driven by her goal to help small businesses in any way that she can, Michelle works with her clients to build, grow, thrive, pivot, and particularly now, survive. There's cash in that balance sheet. Now we're going to introduce you to ways to get loans that can be forgiven. But there's also cash that you have on your balance sheet and you need to, to, to figure out where it is and get it out. She knows that local businesses create jobs and opportunities that drive the economy and those jobs are what make our cities the place that they are. So welcome to the, to the panel, Michelle. And then I'll also introduce uh, last but not least, a uh, wonderful panelist from a phenomenal bank uh, she have a strong banking background, and that's Ivory Salmon. Ivory Salmon is Vice President and Business Banking Relationship Manager at Key Bank, where she advocates for and provides financial resources to companies across Indiana. This includes capital resources used to fund commercial real estate transactions, business acquisitions, franchise startups, equipment financing, as well as permanent working capital. And uh, I borrowed in all of those cases from banks in every one of the categories I just read off to grow my business. Her work in financial services began in 2003. Ivory serves as an active member for Key Bank's African American organization is KBING and is a Key for Women certified advisor. Ivory has held various leadership roles for financial institutions, both in Chicago and Indianapolis, where she is nationally recognized for her leadership and service into the, in the community. Now, be, before I let the panelists speak, I just want to make a, a, a couple of comments on banking. There, there's nothing, one thing I've learned in this PPP process is that there are minority firms that do not have banking relationships. And I was surprised to hear that. I know that in various minority communities, particularly African American, we don't have bank, banking relationships as individuals. As a business, that is totally unacceptable. You have to have a banking relationship. You immediately open a business checking account. You begin a banking relationship with that bank. 
and if you and you want to qualify for loans if you don't qualify for business loans you want to work with that bank that banker to understand what's needed for you to grow and you know successfully close a, a bank loan and then you build from there to grow that line of credit to grow your business if i'm fortunate to get a 25 million dollar or $25,000 contract, whatever the size of your company, I need to have the capital to buy the inventory, to hire the staff, and to finance the receivables. And so to grow, you cannot grow a business without a banking relationship. So, you know, key banks here today, you know, reach out, get some contact information uh, if you don't have a banking relationship. Last thing I'll say is that if you don't have a banking relationship, there are a number of banks across Indiana that will process your PPP loan application today. And they're very, very happy to do it, even though you don't have a relationship. But uh, let's not let the week go by without all of us on this call having a banking relationship that we're going to grow from here. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Drexler and Dan is going to give us a presentation and then we'll move to the next panelist. Dan, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you much, John, and, uh, and good luck corralling us today. I think uh, you, you have the, quite the task, so thank you for that. Uh, thanks Indiana Black Expo for, uh, for making this possible as well. We're looking forward to partnering with, uh, with Indiana Black Expo going forward for the next several months actually over a series of small business seminars. So this is, uh, this is the kickoff and I believe it's the most timely of this, the seminars that, uh, that we have in mind given the, uh, the urgency of the PPP and the need in the community and Hopefully, most of you here have accessed this and you're here to hear from Michelle and Ivory over forgiveness and what are the next steps. You know, I'm here largely as the guy that you start with. If you have not applied for PPP, if you have not looked at the other programs, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, or if you haven't qualified for those and you want to look at what the state's offering for the, for the very small companies, you know, the Small Business Development Center can work you through those programs and see where we can plug you in as best as possible. Um, the Indiana State Business, uh, Small Business Development Center actually is a network of 10 centers across the state. So whether you're in Indianapolis, Fort Wayne, South Bend, Evansville, um, Lake County area, you know, we have a center that can plug you into the services that we offer, including the business counseling, you know, setting up your business planning, working you through the disaster recovery efforts, everything that, uh, that you might need as a small business. That's the focus of our work. And as John mentioned in the introductions, you know, the services that we provide are free. Of course, with every free program, there is a little bit of registration so that the government will have, your, have you, you know, sign some paperwork, but that's a small price to pay when everything else comes at, at no cost. Uh, so, it's, it's actually been an interesting time. Um, I started in March, so you can imagine. Uh, I was here seven days believing that I joined the organization for Central Indiana, and uh, we were going to grow businesses, start businesses, live dreams, and help everyone get going. And seven days later, we're housed here at Butler University, and the campus shut down, the students went home, the pandemic hit, everything was stopped. And our phone calls immediately went from, what do I do to set up my, my small business and my LLC to, hey, how do I file for unemployment insurance? Do I qualify for these programs? You know, what, what can we do to survive? And it was, it was an interesting switch. And I would admit, I would, it caught me on my heels quite a bit because when you start a new job, you're like, hey, this is gonna be awesome. And then that just is not what you were expecting. <laughs> um, so, but through it all, what's really been fascinating is the entrepreneurial spirit that we've seen come through from this, whether people were at home for a few weeks, you know, furloughed, whether they were, you know, working remotely. What we've actually seen happen is people got excited about this and they started looking at what can I do for myself? You know, what business may I start? 
and it's been quite exciting to see people come out from uh, from from their own homes with ideas that they want to take ownership of their lives and, and move their small business forward. And that's really a strength of our office is to take those dreams, take that vision, help you put the structure in place, and then you know, take you to the next level. And even you know, so far as to help with the business planning, as I mentioned, the marketing side, you know, preparing yourself to talk to someone you know, like Ivory with Key Bank, you know, getting everything organized so that you're, you're more presentable in a way that makes financial sense and you know, can make a really good first impression with those lenders. You know, so our services are across the board. We go from everywhere, you know, from the startup to the existing manufacturing. Um, we, we look at companies 500 employees or less. Uh, most of our companies are not near 500 employees. You know, we're looking at the startups, which may be one to five people. You know, you have a, a small group or an individual that says, hey, this is what I'd like to do. And that's, that's what we're here for. That's exactly the audience that we like to work with. And, and take you to that next level. I think as we go through the programs, you know, we're, we're here to talk about PPP and the loan forgiveness largely and, you know, what's still available. You know, we certainly can talk about the economic injury disaster loan uh, as we get into Q&A. It is still available. Um, you know, one caveat, the advance, the grant portion of that has been, uh, has been run through, the, the funding has been run through. So, the, the loan itself is still available, but the grant is no longer available. The state of Indiana restart grant is available for, for small companies. Uh, that's up to $10,000 of reimbursable expenses. So we can get into that a little bit later as well as, as we go into Q&A and talk about some other options that uh, if you didn't qualify for PPP or you're hesitant to, to go that direction, you know, certainly we can work with you to find out uh, other avenues. Um, I think we'll turn it back to John here. I think that uh, that gives you a good overview of what our network provides and the services. And then as we get into Q&A, I think we can add, add some more details to that. So thank you, John. Uh, Michelle's uh, presentation and her thoughts and and uh, again, listen carefully. This is great information coming today. Michelle? Yep, thanks. Um, so as John mentioned early on, we, we have a virtual outsourced bookkeeping service. We actually operate nationally and we primarily help small businesses um, under $10 million in revenue just to get their financials done on a monthly basis. Um, we realized there was a gap in just an easy service to help entrepreneurs. And my whole goal in life is to help entrepreneurs sleep better at night. So that's why we created Keep. And then we also do part-time um, outsourced CFO services as well. So one of the things that we, of course, got heavily involved in as soon as COVID hit and the PPP program was released was working with our businesses on that. And, um, you know, in the beginning, it involved helping people apply for loans and kind of understand, you know, what, are they eligible? Um, how much are they eligible for? What does it look like for your FTE calculations? And how do you figure out, um, you know, how many employees you have even for the application process? So now we're in the realm of PPP forgiveness. And I'm not sure how many people um, on this webinar have actually received PPP loans, but it's gotten pretty confusing in terms of how do you know what you're going to be eligible for in terms of forgiveness? So, you know, the, the banks are still working on figuring out what the application process looks like. PPP has gone through a lot of changes, but, um, you know, I, we've got some information on our website. If you go to keepfinancials.com, that has a couple of different documents that will explain how do you calculate an FTE. Um, one of the changes, like you would think that's just an employee, but one of the changes they made was really how you calculate those when they released the changes around June 5th. Um, so for example, now if you have a part-time employee uh, and they work 20 hours a week, you can count that as a 0.5 FTE and that seems pretty simple. But if somebody works 10 hours a week, you can either count them as a 0.25 FTE or a 0.5 FTE. So there's a whole analysis when you look at forgiveness to figure out what your employee number looks like and if you'll be fully forgiven or not that really depends on how you're calculating what is an actual FTE. So we have a several page document out there that can walk you through that process and help you understand that. Um, there are also a few changes that have been proposed. Uh, most recently, there, there was information released this morning 
about some proposed changes to the PPP program, that they will still be offering it for people who haven't received PPP loans, for businesses who haven't received it going forward. Uh, but they are going to add a, a qualification that your business has to be less than 50% of revenue from the prior year to be eligible. For businesses that have already received a PPP loan, the proposed language says that they're going to put in place some sort of working capital program for businesses that continue to see a reduction in revenue due to COVID to help, help them continue on. Um, another thing that we've really been working with people a lot on is document retention. So um, when we go to look at forgiveness, there is a possibility, and, and one of the things in this proposed bill is that loans under $150,000 are automatically forgiven, which would be wonderful because that, that actually accounts for 86% of the PPP loans already issued. So that really does a lot to help small business and banks, frankly, in terms of their ability to kind of process that information. But for those who end up not in that category, one of the things that we have found is the list of documents is pretty extensive. And so we're encouraging our clients and businesses we help to just get organized around what those expenses look like and the documentation you need to show them. So for example, on the FTE side, there will be either um, payroll reports that can help you calculate some of your FTE numbers, but also your tax forms that are your 940s and 941s, your payroll company probably files with the federal government. And those will be used to help verify wages and numbers of employees. So you'll want to hang on to those, as well as some of the non-payroll expenses that you're eligible to be forgiven for, are things like uh, rent, so office rent and utilities. And what they'll be looking for is both a utility statement or a rent statement that they can verify what those charges are, as well as a copy of your bank statement showing that that money actually came out of your account. So we're just trying to help people get prepared for those things because it's a lot easier to organize it kind of now and along the way than it is to try to go back and uh, do it retroactively. So another thing we're cautioning people on is the owner's compensation that when we, there was an eight week program, um, it capped at $15,384, which was basically an annualized 100,000. But when they changed the time frame to 24 weeks, they didn't do it pro rata. So the cap on that is now $20,833, even though it would cover 24 weeks instead of eight weeks. So for people who have uh, several employees, just making sure that, that you're only expecting to be forgiven for that max owner's comp amount is really important. Um, and then also I would say the 60% payroll piece. So most businesses kind of naturally fall in this if they brought a lot of their employees back but for some that are maybe slower to bring employees back, making sure that the total amount of the PPP money you've spent was at least 60% spent on payroll is one of the things they're also looking for to provide maximum forgiveness. So uh, that's a ton of information I just threw at you guys. So I'll kind of pause there. I'm sure more will come up in the Q&A, but um, that's just a little bit of an overview of some of the things we're trying to help our businesses with at the moment. So I'm guessing, Ivory, we're on to you. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Perfect, perfect. Yes. Muted. Okay. I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. As John mentioned, I am a business banking relationship manager uh, for KeyBank. I am here to discuss some of the impacts to minority owned businesses specifically as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and then also how to nav navigate those nuances. Michelle and Dan talked a great deal about uh, some of the requirements and being adequately prepared for the for application as well as for uh, forgiveness. So, um, but I, I thought I'd be remiss to not to share some information about KeyBank and, and how we service our clients. So KeyBank, we are a regional bank. We are based out of Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, we service uh, with service out of 31 states. We have over a thousand branches across our network. With about 16,000 employees, we are um, among the top 10 SBA 7A lenders. And so I like to start with that because it gives you kind of an understanding of how passionate we are for our small business clients, specifically those in the communities that we serve. So 
I'll talk a little bit about the impact. I'll talk about navigating through COVID-19 from a banking perspective. Um, I'll touch a little bit. Michelle has, has done a phenomenal job at going through the forgiveness piece, um, as well as the importance to John's point on uh, having a banking relationship. So those are the things that we'll talk about today. Um, one of the things that we're finding uh, from a bank perspective is that amongst the largest black owned businesses um, in the industries um, are, are most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Those include professional services, healthcare, retail, personal services. Um, we all know the impact that the labor market has undergone as a result of social distancing, um, consumer spending has been impacted. And so we've been helping to educate our clients um, through a lot of different areas, one of which is um, cash flow, liquidity. What does your liquidity look like? Do you have a savings plan? How can you manage your debt? We talk to clients about uh, negotiating with, with their vendors, with their landlords and, and, and lenders and talking about things like, um, um, you know, like rent forgiveness and things like that. We talk about forecasting. Um, technology. So what does your business continuity plan look like? What are some of the impacts that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has had on your business specifically? And then ultimately, um, the people, your people, and we find some of our business owners have migrated to a, a work from home capacity. We, we are all in some kind of work from home capacity on this webinar today. Um, the impact to salaries, benefits program, how your employees manage their stress, um, and then we've been talking about the debt relief program. So you've heard some of the panelists discuss the SBA um, economic injury disaster loan. Uh, we've talked about the PPP program. Um, I don't believe any of the panelists have mentioned the SBA debt relief program where the SBA is paying six months of payments for people who have SBA 7A loans. Um, and that's something that for those of you who do have 7A loans that you would connect with your lender and get some additional details on whether or not you qualify um, for that. Um, specifically as it relates to the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, Michelle has done a phenomenal job uh, making my life a lot easier and talking about uh, the structure around that program. Um, as you all may know, the loan amount is equal to two and a half times your average monthly payroll from 2019. Um, the loan is considered forgivable uh, to Michelle's point if FTE and payroll are maintained for eight weeks after funding. And then the proceeds must be used at least 60% toward payroll expenses. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the impact if that loan is deemed unforgivable. Uh, that loan is payable typically six months after the, that period has ended, and there is a 1% rate on that, and it's payable over a two-year uh, term. So we talk about like SBA guidance uh, regarding uh, forgiveness. We are still working on the final phases of the application process for those of you who we're fortunate enough to receive PPP funding and are looking for additional ways um, to collect your documents and be adequately prepared to apply for forgiveness. Uh, we are working on the final phases of the application and we anticipate having that uh, sometime in August. Uh, but some things to prepare, um, again, a lot of this you've heard already, is any documentation that would support any cash compensation, documentation showing the average number of FTE on your payroll, documentation verifying, the payments that you've made because a portion of that PPP funding can be used for rent, lease, utility payments, and the, uh, things like that. So um, those are some of the things to kind of think about getting prepared as you look to obtain uh, forgiveness. Um, here at Key, we like to be the first line of defense for our clients. Um, we are very passionate and we have a focus centered around your overall financial wellness. Um, so John talked about the importance of having a banking relationship. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, the importance of having a resource, a uh, person that's available to guide you through the nuances of the different programs that are available specific to your business um, and how we can help you, not just from a forgiveness perspective, but just holistically. What are your plans? Um, what are some of the other things that you have in play as it relates to adequate cash flow and um, are you prepared for the next emergency and sort of what does that look like? Um, we talk about the impact of, of, of your credit score. We talk about the impact of, of financial wellness and wealth planning and in, in, in the long term, from a long term perspective, what that looks like for your business and what you plan to do 
post-retirement. So we like to have a holistic approach with our clients. We've done a lot around um, like strategizing with our clients and providing additional guidance um, and support. Um, I, I didn't want to, a lot of what we, what I'm prepared to discuss, we've already kind of gone over. Just a couple of other points uh, to, to kind of add is a lot of things we're doing wirelessly. So we're doing a lot of things virtually. So we talk about the impact of protecting your assets and keeping your businesses safe and planning for business succession and all of that. So all encompassing. So I wanted to leave enough time to open it up for any questions um, that you guys had. Uh, so I will turn it over to, to John to kind of open up the Q&A. Okay, I am unmuted now. So I want to thank uh, Dan, Michelle, and Ivory. They all three had uh, uh, excellent points to make in their presentations that uh, that are helpful to me as a as a business owner. And um, whatever your business, um, I think you'll be you'll be helped today. Now, you see the Q and A. Uh, on your screens, please submit questions. And, um, and we have a few already, so I'm going to get us started while you all uh, take time to submit your questions. Uh, the other thing I will say again is to remember to complete the survey at the end because that'll help us in planning our next webinar, which is August 3rd. Uh, and so you can let your friends and other business owners and entrepreneurs know that August 3rd, there's another webinar. So I'm going to uh, start off with a question for, for Dan, but, but anyone can weigh in on it. Are there grants available for my startup business, Dan? Uh, largely no, John. And uh, regrettably, free money doesn't exist uh, for startups. Um, now, that, there are caveats to that. There, there are technology grants, there are research grants. Typically, if you have a technology in mind and you want to take it to another level, uh, you can work with universities. There are other partnerships that are strategic that, that offer grant opportunities. But for, in general terms, when you look at uh, you know, what money is out there to get your small business up and going? No, that's why the import, that's the importance of a business plan. That's the importance of presenting yourself to a lender in a, in a really, really, you know, strong way. Um, you need to put your financials together and, and that'll include as your new startup business, they're going to look at your personal financial history as well. So I think that's an important point, one that Ivory or Michelle can probably speak to as well. You know, you're, you're not independent of your business. And that's one thing I think a lot of people go into small business startups believing that, well, that's a business and my life is separate. Well, it's not. You're, you're all tied together. When, the, when lenders look at, look at your business, they're looking at your history as well. And uh, I, I think that's an important thing. So we're working, we work on issues of credit worthiness. We work on issues of education and training and trying to see how can you position yourself personally and as your business to be more viable as a, as a target for a lender. And those are, those are nice things that we can offer in terms of our services. Um, I think I would like to hear, if you don't mind, John, Michelle and Ivory's thoughts on that. Um, but in terms of grants, there's no free money, unfortunately. There are some, there are some money available on the, on the relief side right now um, for, for very small businesses. But in terms of startup monies, no, it's, it's just not, uh, not the, the wonderful rainbow with the pot of gold at the end. Yeah, there are a few things available through, um, you know, like you said, different incubators and, and startup programs. But even right now, those are few and far between. Um, I, I think that one of the things we've seen with startups, too, that sometimes bootstrapping is a blessing. So, you know, when you bootstrap your business, instead of taking money, you maintain full ownership of it. You don't have any debt to owe anybody. So we work with a number of businesses that really started as a side hustle, that people were working other jobs and kind of trying to figure out something on the side and then turned that over time into a business and transitioned it into something full time. And that can be helpful. 
Um, another thing that you, you know, you, Dan and Ivory you probably see a lot is we sometimes see people get in trouble when they take money for their businesses. So it's really easy to take a loan and then be like, yeah, I'll buy dinner for everybody because it's deductible. But people confuse that, you know, that money is still money being spent, even if it's tax deductible. And that, you know, you really want to think about when you're taking money for your business, what the return on every dollar you're spending is. And so you probably don't need to spend a thousand dollars on somebody doing a logo so that, and then printing really you know, high end business cards when you first get started. Make that a you know, crowdsource something for fifty dollars online and then get a small run of business cards to get started because all of that really adds up and makes a big difference in the long run. So um, I'm a big proponent of bootstrapping. I've, I've bootstrapped a number of businesses. And so, you know, don't get discouraged if you're not finding opportunities out there to get funding, because there are some things you can probably do on the side to get things started. And the other point is, as Dan said, you know, when, when you're a small business owner, you are your business financially. So if you really have some very small startup costs, it's worth going into your local bank and talking to them about, is there something as simple as a credit card available that yeah. you can, you know, get a little bit of relief to start things in the beginning. Maybe it has a 0% interest rate for a year and that might give you what you need to just get something that's a side hustle started that will eventually turn into a bigger business. I think I would echo that, Michelle's comments. Um, we do offer here at Key, we do offer small business credit cards. We do offer uh, very small, very small lines of credit uh, for businesses uh, who are starting up. But I think it is imperative um, to really think about and, and, and ascertain what the most viable solution is going to be for your business. And that's where that small business financial wellness review comes in. That's where that relationship comes in because we can help you navigate the nuances. What, what will the funds be used for? Will it be used for fancy dinners and fancy logos? Or is it really something you need to help launch your business? And that's where that guidance piece comes in from a, from a banking perspective. Along those lines, John, I, I think, you know, when we, I mentioned it earlier, but the business planning aspect of this, to, to speak to Ivory and Michelle's point of, you know, where are you going to spend your money? You know, having a written business plan for a small business especially is, is critical because you're able to map out, you know, what you, what you expect of your business. It keeps you kind of on the straight and narrow for your, for your own vision, why you started the business. And then when you get to that little dinner with a thousand dollar tab at the end, it, it makes you pause. You're like, oh, no, 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 we're not going to do this. You know, we're, we're going to White Castle. So, you know, it, it does, the, the bootstrapping is essential at, at the startup level and, and having a nice check in place, being a business plan that really puts your vision on paper and keeps you honest to what you really, the reason you started your business, I think is, is critical. I, I will add to, to the panelists, um, while of all the comments were, were great, I'll give you another little area where you might find some help, and that's a PPE, and that's the uh, personal protective equipment, mask and sanitizer, things like that. There is a grant that the state have up to $5,000 for businesses with 150 employees or less. And you can go to the state's website and familiarize yourself with that. It's pretty easy to apply for. I've gotten help for my company. We've gotten masks and other uh, PPE. And then you, you, you buy it, you submit your uh, receipts, and you get reimbursed. And you're gonna need a state business registration number. So you're gonna to have to be a registered business with the state of Indiana to access those funds and no more than 150 employees. But I know several uh, of our participants today are, are salon owners. So if you own a hair salon, you, you need some PPE there's an opportunity to, to get some at, you know, for, in that particular situation. Um, let's see. Uh, hey, John, could, could I tag on to that a second? Yes, Dan. Um, 
It's actually, you can actually, through that restart program, get more than just the PPE reimbursement, which is nice. So if you have utility bills over the last few months, if you've been negatively impacted by the COVID you know, pandemic issues, if you've been shut down through the, the, this period, you know, we actually, it goes up to 10,000, um, depending upon what your, what your, your level is of, of damage. You can either spread it out over four months or compact it into two months. And it can cover your lease payments, your mortgage payments. It can cover your PPE, as you mentioned. Um, so, so there are some options there from the pandemic relief side through the state uh, for qualifying businesses uh, that, that could be substantial. And as, as John pointed out, it's, it's reimbursement. So you're going to have to turn in the receipts of something that you've already paid for. But it is, a, it is available and they've set aside uh, quite a bit of money. I think it's up to $30 million set aside to help small businesses get through this. So that, that's definitely available. Uh, we can help you work through that process at our centers around the state. Um, um, so great point, John. Thank you for bringing that up. Sure, sure enough. I'm going to ask a few questions from the audience. Um, and... Uh, so this one is from, uh, let's see, Sh uh, Chasson Martin, is the PPP loan based on credit score? And so if someone could answer that for Chasson. I'll take that one. So hi, Sasha. So it is a credit product, right? So those are things that we do look at from a lending perspective. I am not an underwriter. Um, I do encourage you, if you are looking to obtain PPP funding, I do encourage you to visit um, a, your local bank or even a local key bank. Um, I can certainly make my information available to you and talk you through that process. Um, it is considered a loan, um, but the amount of impact that your credit score has on that um, would be would be something that an underwriter would review. I can tell you, I have several clients with really low credit scores who are still eligible for the PPP, and then were actually denied for the um, SBA idle loans. So I think there was a lot more leniency given to the PPP if it was factored in at all, um, but it certainly was a much larger part of the idle loan process. Okay, let's take another question from the audience. Uh, oh, our questions are Chasson Martin, again, uh, you, I started my business right before the pandemic. Do I qualify for the PPP loan? And, and of course, the answer to that depends on the date that you started your business before the pandemic. I'll turn it over to the panelists to answer that question. Yep, as long as your business was operational by February 15th of this year, you're eligible for a PPP loan. Um, they, there hasn't been a lot of guidance released on what that means to be operational, but the way I've interpreted that is if you can show business activity that you were paying expenses and producing revenue by February 15th of this year, that that would make you eligible for the loan. Okay, we have another question from Anika King. And that question is, you know, I mean, Anika feels that this is great news, but she want to make sure that businesses like salons are eligible for the PPE grants. And I believe they are, but if the panelists have anything to weigh in on that, please do. Um, but I believe they are. Yeah, John, um, all businesses, if they're registered, as you mentioned, um, if, if they're registered in the state of Indiana and they've been in business, um, one, of the, one of the PPE reimbursements, the restart, also involves having been profitable in 2019. So you had to have been in business in 2019 and show a profit. So if you can qualify for that, if you did not take PPP, 
money. If you did not take the EIDL, then that means you're a candidate for the restart grant. And that's a grant. That's up to the $10,000 as, as you mentioned, John, and that provides the, uh, the PPE uh, reimbursements, the mortgage lease you know, reimbursements, the lease on personal on, on business equipment. So, so that is possible. There are other programs through, uh, throughout the state. I know Marion County through the Indy Chamber of Commerce has a $5,000 PPE grant and that is again reimbursable. So uh, if, if, uh, if the, the, the participant is in Marion County, we can certainly get her plugged into the Indy Chamber program, which could provide that reimbursement up to $5,000 on PPE. There's lots of P's in our programs, aren't there? PPE, PPP, it's like, you think they'd, they'd name it something different. Okay, thanks a lot. So we'll go to another question from the uh, participants. Um, and, and any of you can weigh in on this. I don't know, Dan, if you have a program to, to work with, with, with folks like this. If not, I know Michelle's business certainly does this. If a business has, has gotten behind in record keeping what resources can get you back on track? Sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So I always encourage businesses, if, if you're not at the point that you're big enough yet or can afford to hire a bookkeeper or to outsource your bookkeeping services, then there's a really simple way to keep track of your finances. And it basically looks like creating an Excel spreadsheet that you set up like a check register. So if you think about what a bank's gonna look for or what the IRS is gonna look for for taxes, it's really about money in and money out and what it was used for. So if you can create an Excel spreadsheet that you put something as simple as the date, the category of the expense, so think about that broadly, like meals, travel, technology, utility bill, rent payment, and then the money that came out and then same dates for revenue that came in, and then take that make sure you have the backup for that, that you have the bank statement or the, the bill or whatever it is and start a folder for every month of the year. So all of your March utility bill, cell phone bill, all of that stuff goes in a March folder, April stuff goes in an April folder. That at least gives you some organization that you can hand a spreadsheet and all of the backup to a CPA to do your taxes at the end of the year or to your banker to show that you're keeping track of everything you have. It's not always easy for small business owners to teach themselves QuickBooks. Um, it's really difficult to hire independent bookkeepers sometimes because there's a lot of embezzlement that happens. So if you're gonna hire your own bookkeeper, I highly recommend you check references and do a background check before you use someone and then make sure someone's double checking their work just to make sure that you're not gonna be the, the victim of that. But sometimes it, it gets overwhelming to think about how you do this. So starting with a simple Excel spreadsheet before you can afford to outsource it or hire someone is a really good way to get started. You know, John, we, we have... I'll say... Oh, sorry, sorry, Ivory. I'm sorry. Um, and sometimes that goes back to that relationship piece. I mean, Michelle made some really good points, but when you think about having that relationship with your banker and the way that your statements are organized, and um, there are certain reporting um, that we offer through KeyBank that will um, categorize your transactions, which makes that bookkeeping much easier for someone who, quite frankly, doesn't have the time or even the wherewithal to organize all of those details. And so that's another one of those resources and value adds in having a, a banking relationship. Sorry, Dan. No, 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 that was great. Um, you know, within our network statewide, we actually pilot different programs. And uh, if, if you happen to be a participant on this, on this webinar from Southeast Indiana, which Jeffersonville up through Seymour, that direction, um, that center out of the greater Louisville area in Southeast Indiana actually is piloting a CARES Act kind of COVID impact um, accounting grant. So if you're a small business in need of some of the services Ivory and Michelle mentioned, you know, you can go through our center in, in Southeast Indiana and they'll actually have a grant right now that, uh, that could help you get some of those services. 
Very good. So let's see, I'm gonna take uh, another Q and A question. Okay, now this, this question, I spoke to earlier and, and Dan, I know you provide some, some level of this service. Shasson Martim is asking, does anyone help with the writing of a business plan? That is, that is one of the, the key components of our counseling services. We have a step-by-step -step plan. We have templates available. Um, what you do when you, when you sign on as a client to our services, again, at no cost, we'll pair you with a business advisor. That's kind of your sounding board. It's someone that you get to go back to and ask questions. Um, they'll help you craft your business plan. They'll lay out the template as you fill in the spots. They'll review it along with you and, uh, and help put more meat into that, into that plan. And when you're, when you're done through the process, it's actually kind of fun to look back from where you started to where you end up. And uh, it, it's a nice roadmap. It, it really is. So certainly, certainly that's, that's a great service that we offer. Very good. I will uh, move on to some other questions. You know, if, if I'm a general contractor who employs 1099 subcontractors, how can I apply for PPP funding? So if you employ subcontractors, you're still eligible for the PPP loan, but it's gonna be primarily for your owner's compensation and then rent and utilities. So the PPP loan doesn't cover independent contractors because independent contractors themselves are eligible for their own PPP loans. Okay, very good. So uh, to take another one. That was actually a great topic, guys. We, I mean, that was throughout the whole process of this application. Um, the 1099s uh, were, were quite, quite the common question. So I'm glad that came up here. Sorry for interrupting, John. I was, it was great to hear that question. It was great to see Michelle's answer. So thank you. Sure enough. What are the tax consequences of the PPP loans? So this is a great question and one that is still a little bit in contention. Um, I, my thought on this is that we're not going to hear final guidance on this until towards the end of the calendar year, most likely, um, purely because tax, you know, the first tax deadline that really matters um, in terms of businesses for 2020 is March 15th of 2021. So I think because of everything else going on, it's kind of being pushed to the back a little bit because it's not a time sensitive question. However, the way the language is written right now, there is a tax consequence, although it's not a, it's not direct, it's kind of indirect. So you're not going to like receive a 1099 that says you received the PPP loan for income, but the way it's written right now, you won't be able to deduct the expenses that are forgiven you, that you used your PPP loan for from your taxes. So for a lot of businesses, what that's going to result in is a an increase in your taxes of roughly 25 to 30% of the amount of your PPP loan. So what we're encouraging businesses to do right now is to actually set some of that money aside in a savings account to set aside 25 to 30% of, of what you received for your PPP loan, understanding that you're most likely going to, the way it's written today, you're gonna to have a tax consequence that will come next year. So what we don't want businesses to do is if, if that language holds up, which we're all hoping it doesn't, but if it holds up, then we don't want anyone to be surprised when they get a tax bill next year that is a lot more than they expected because they couldn't deduct those expenses. Very good. What are some other ways to prepare financially in the event of another shutdown uh, apart from PPP? I mean, we're really encouraging companies right now to take a good hard look at their expenses and see if there are things like software subscriptions they can scale back on, maybe scale back on the number of users you have in different software subscriptions. If, there are just, if there's any type of 
you know, spending that's maybe more discretionary. So if you used to do holiday parties, you know, probably cut that out of your budget this year. If you were doing larger employee gifts, maybe cut that out of your budget this year. Um, you know, put in place that if there are business development expenses that maybe they're lower meal limits than they were before if you're doing any type of in-person business development, but to really take a hard look at those expenses and also to really take a hard look at your organizational chart. I mean, part of this is going to be if for some reason what they predict is going to happen with flu season and COVID this fall actually happens, there's a possibility we're going to see more shutdowns again. So really understanding, does it make more sense for me to cut everyone's salary by 20%? Does it make more sense for me to temporarily lay off some employees? It's also good to look at what the unemployment um, kind of what offerings are at that point in time, because then you can make a decision of, if there's somebody who's actually gonna do better on unemployment than they are at 75% of their current salary, it might be better for the employee to actually lay them off than to keep them on at a reduced salary. So we're really just encouraging businesses to look ahead a little bit and reevaluate just kind of their structure and their org chart and everything else. And as we always say in business, cash is king. So one of the things that we talk about all of the time with our businesses is really trying to have three to six months of reserves for operating expenses that you have in an account somewhere or available on a line of credit you can get through your local bank or your banking relationship. So I think that's really important, especially in times like these. And I can tell you that for all of our small businesses, the ones who had actually set that up over the last few years and had reserves in place were really able to focus when the shutdowns hit on what do we need to do as a business? Are our employees okay? How do we make sure we serve them? How do we go remote if we can do that? And they, they had a little bit more breathing room because they had prepared for a rainy day. So that's not always easy to do. And your, most businesses can't just say like, oh, I'm magically going to put six months of operating expenses in my account. But you can work towards that. So even adding a little bit to savings on a monthly basis eventually adds up over time. So you know, we, we think about this a lot in both short term and long term. So short term, the expense cutting side I was mentioned, and then long term, really preparing for if this happens again in the future. And I would just add to that, to Michelle's point, uh, the importance of, I, I mean, I can't emphasize, if I sound like a broken record, having the relationship with your banker, because those are things that we educate our clients on, having six months liquidity, six to 12 months liquidity, how can you manage your expenses if you are forced to close your doors? We talk about things like having an operating line of credit. What will you do during seasons in which you don't have the influx of cash coming in? How can you leverage those resources? And that's when having that relationship is of utmost importance because they can help guide you. And to Michelle's point, where do you start? You don't walk in the bank um, when you first open a business with 12 months of liquidity. And if you do, let me give you my cell phone number right now. Um, but no, I think it's important. I think it's important to, to have that relationship because we can help guide you and we can help get you there. Um, so thank you, Michelle, uh, for those for those remarks. Yeah, and to your point, I mean, my, my banker in my business has been a really instrumental part of my kind of advisory team for a long time. And when you build that relationship proactively, it's really helpful if you get in trouble in your business. So in times like these, if you happen to do work with larger companies, for example, some of them are starting to pay a lot slower. So I ended up in a situation once that we had a line of credit and um, I had a client that had to start paying their invoices in 90 days instead of 30 days. And so it was a really tough situation for the business and I picked up the phone and called my banker and they were able to give us a temporary extension on our line of credit until we got past that rough patch and then they pulled it back after 90 days and everything was fine. But I, I think that could have gone very differently if I didn't have a relationship with the banker and didn't keep them updated on my business. So, um, you know, it really is, your banker can be a really important part of your advisory team and will be there for you when things go bad for your business to the extent they can, because underwriting still exists, but to the extent they can, they will work with you however they can to help you solve problems. Michelle may cringe at, at my suggestion here from, from the accounting side of life, but one thing that we've looked at in terms of our client base, which are largely very, very small companies, is kind of bartering services, trying to trade things out. You know, if, if you're paying for a storage unit and maybe you have somebody that 
you know, has, has some space available. Maybe you can trade out something you can offer for, you know, putting your stuff there and eliminating that expense, you know. So we, we've tried to pair people at different times with some success and some not so much success, but, uh, you know, trying to find where we can trade things out at no cost because I, I, think, I think we still are not out of the woods with this clearly. And, you know, as you can build those relationships down the way, I mean, it, it still is a good relationship to have in, in healthy times, it could be a critical relationship to have with other businesses, other small businesses um, during, during critical times like this. And there's actually a way to account for that really easily. Oh, so good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I knew of a small business uh, some, oh, some years back. He did a lot with bartering. He really did an awful lot. He paid his rent with bartering and, you know, he was the bartering king and did it well, really, really, really did it well. And, you know, conserved cash with that. So that's a good point there as well. So you all made some excellent points there um, because, you know, the, the number of cases are rising. We don't know what lies ahead. Uh, I'm optimistic on going out 12, 14 months with the number of uh, therapeutics and vaccines that are uh, in, in uh, various stages of testing and approval. But in between time, we, we don't know what we might face. So you do want to plan for worse times than we're, than we're suffering now. Now this we've been talking about all along, but let's go through step by step. The question is, what steps do I follow to apply for PPP funding if I don't have a banking relationship? Now, I'm going to throw out there that I know a number of banks that are accepting applications, even if you don't have banking relationships. But what we're going to do for you right now is the panelists will go through step by step what to do to apply for a PPP loan. Any one of the panelists like to step up on that? I can speak to that. So um, obviously you would wanna leverage someone like um, Dan and Michelle to help you get everything that you need ready for application, right? So um, we are accepting applications here at Key. Um, I am happy to field some of those questions um, as they come in and provide, I believe some resource information will go out with my contact information. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me directly and I can help guide you either to someone in one of our branches um, or, or one of my partners who can help navigate you through that, through that process. Um, I do think that it's important um, to have things like your entity docs prepared. So um, if you are registered with the Indiana Secretary of State, if you have an operating agreement, it's important that we know who the owners of the business are. We, um, we will need your payroll records. So I think it was Michelle who mentioned the 940s and the 941s and having that information prepared because we're going to look, we're going to need to look at those items um, as well. And so we can help you through that. Um, we, uh, the, first, the first step obviously is to make contact with someone if you have a relationship uh, with a bank, specifically if you have a lending relationship with that bank, I highly encourage you uh, to connect with your banker, your business banking relationship manager. If you do not have a banking relationship, uh, feel free to reach out to me or visit any one of our branches and we can help you uh, navigate down that path and prepare you with all you need um, to get the adequate funding. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot. That was, that was great. And uh, let's see, have another question here. Congress is, is currently meeting their, their meeting this week. Um, we don't think there'll be any results of that for the next couple weeks. Michelle was speaking to, um, you know, some of the things that may come down the pike. Are there anything, is there anything that any of you would like to add 
that our participants today and attendees can be on the lookout for that might benefit them as small business owners? Anything that's being discussed mm -hmm. by the House, the Senate, or the uh, White House that may come out that may help them? This is, uh, it's not so much what's being discussed now, but I think as we enter into these, these, this topic, it's important to note that every day of this, these programs, that there have been changes. So what you learn today may not be what happens tomorrow. So continue to ask the same questions, confirm that what you heard yesterday is still current today because they are modifying things administratively. Um, so it's not just through congressional actions, it's actually administratively, they'll interpret it in a way that impacts your decision as a business. So it's, it's not so much the big decisions, it's those little decisions that quietly happen that have been impacting us. And, you know, people like, like Ivory, myself, Michelle, you know, we're, we're hearing them, but it doesn't always seem to get out into the public. So ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. Yeah, I would say um, you can also, if you go to your local bank's website, or I'm sure Key has, like most, Key probably has a coronavirus section of their website that has anything that they're seeing in terms of news releases. If you look up like your local business law firm, they're prob they probably have something on their website that you can sign up for alerts. So those are good places to get some of that information. And I think it's helpful to have it from them. Um, but I, the other thing I would say is, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of business owners who are really kind of banking on another big round of PPP. And I don't think that's gonna be the case. I think that people who haven't received it may be eligible to apply for a longer period of time or maybe in a second wave. But what they're talking about for another round looks like it's probably gonna be something more like a working capital loan that would probably be credit contingent and, and, gone, and going through the SBA. So, um, you know, I think it becomes really important if you're a business who's already taken PPP that you really focus on what do you need to do to kind of trim down and stay lean and be prepared to weather the storm because there just isn't a guarantee out there that there's going to be a lot more relief available. Yeah, I, I think to add on to that, what we may see happen in, in the next rounds of stimulus are really community-based funding, cities, municipalities, counties, state funding. So they'll be looking at infrastructure projects. They'll be looking at um, municipal spending, public spending dollars that could impact some of the some of the participants on this this webinar. You know, so so be looking at opportunities um, locally for either direct business sales and relationships or even potentially grants that were being administered through your local government that could come out of this. I agree with Michelle. I don't see that they're going to go wholesale into small business, you know, relief in another round, but it could come at you from another angle. Okay. I also agree with Michelle. I'm sorry. I also agree with Michelle. Um, one of the questions that I've that I fielded uh, for my clients is when they came out with this additional round of PPP funding, I did have some clients inquire um, whether or not they can get additional uh, PPP funds, uh, those of which who were fortunate enough to participate in the first round. And uh, for those of you who may have that question, the answer is sadly no. Uh, the, the opening of the, the Paycheck Protection Program in the second and third rounds were uh, designated for those, those of you who uh, were not able to take advantage of funding in, in the first and second round. Okay. So I'll go back to our audience uh, questions. Um, one from Renee Miles. Um, do you have, do you know of any good forms, an Excel spreadsheet or the like that will calculate your spending on PPP loans? And I would just say in my companies, we created our own. We did it on Excel spreadsheets, but we, we just kept track of all the expenses that were legitimate PPP fund expenses. And, um, and for the, the up, 
upcoming loan forgiveness program, we had all that data tracked and prepared. And so while we haven't applied for forgiveness yet, we're waiting for the SBA portal to open. Our plan is to apply for forgiveness uh, once that portal is open. Our banker will take our application, but it does no good until it's ready to be submitted to the, to the portal, which you know, I'm expecting that portal to open any week now. I believe it hasn't because of something Michelle mentioned earlier, which is simply that uh, um, they are likely to provide forgiveness for those loans of $150,000 or less. And as Michelle indicated, that's 86% of PPP loans. And so that's probably when they'll open the portal. I don't know that. And uh, once they do though, I'll submit my application. But we've been keeping track on Excel spreadsheets that we created. Uh, anyone wanna add to that, feel free. Yeah, I think, you know, you can always ask your banker if, if they've maybe come up with a tool because I know there are some organizations who have, but. It really is because the, the information isn't going to automatically get into an application form or an Excel spreadsheet from your kind of source systems. It probably is easier to just create something on your own where you're just having um, someone on your, like if you have an, an administrative person, that's also a person who can just take the payroll reports and put them in that spreadsheet or you can do it yourself. Um, but just tracking those categories. And again, almost the same thing I said with the very simple record keeping earlier. If you just have like the data, you know, the date the money was spent, what the category is from a PPP perspective. So whether it's payroll, health benefits, rent, utilities, um, and then the amount. And as long as you have the documents to tie that to that I mentioned in the beginning that you're gonna need to probably submit with your forgiveness application, that should be plenty. It doesn't need to be more complicated than that. That's right. Any other comments? Okay, let's take another. The only thing I would add, I'm sorry, is that no, you go ahead. we've had some we've had some clients that have requested funding uh, to a specific checking account that is only used for payroll expenses. That just makes their life so much easier. Um, that that account is specifically earmarked. We funded the PPP money into that checking account, and the funds coming out of that checking account are used for the sole purposes of uh, payroll. Uh, payroll transactions, as well as, you know, some rent, lease, you know, utility payments, things like that. But that account is used only for PPP eligible expenses, making it a lot more easy to, to navigate as well. So that could be an option. That's good. Good. Great point. We have a participant question from Carmen Alsom. Does Indiana have a program such as LIST that extends outside of the realm of Marion County? And um, I'll say before turning it over to the panelists that everything we've been discussing today extends statewide. This is uh, about, this whole panel and discussion is about the state of Indiana. Now, I will say uh, Marion County receives some CARES Act funds themselves. So some things that you can get from the state are for outside of Marion County. And um, because Marion County have funds of their own and some things that you can get from the state, you can, and you live within Marion County, the state will still handle it, but Marion County is funding it. But everything that we're discussing apply to all the counties, in some cases, excluding Marion County, but in all cases, all of the other counties. I'll turn it over to the panelists to add to that. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I can I can address some of this, and uh, I you know, thank you, Carmen, for the question. Um, 
You know, we, we've been researching. Uh, we continue to look to find out what private organizations might be offering relief. Um, some have their own terms, their own geography, their own specific uh, program, you know, desires. Just like I mentioned before, Southeast Indiana has a, has a small business accounting program that they've piloted and have put out there. Um, some other regions have different programs. So there's there's nothing that I've found right now that is that is similar to what the LISC opportunity was in some targeted zones in Marion County. If, uh, if any other participants that might be on the webinar are, are aware of something, please share those in the question in the Q&A as well so we can you know, take a look at those and share those with, with other small businesses. Okay, uh, I, if, if, if no one want, else want to weigh in on that, thanks Dan, that was very helpful, that response. Um, Renee Miles has a question. The one thing that confuses me with PPP loans, um, I know a company has to use 70% uh, on payroll. Is a company allowed to use all the funds on payroll? And, and um, first off, it was 75% minimum on payroll. You could always and can still today use all of the funds on payroll. Now, the 75% have been reduced to 60%. So you have to spend a minimum of 60% on payroll, but it can be up to 100%. Uh, anyone want to uh, add anything to that response? I think you covered it. You covered it. Okay, let's take uh, one more from the Ivory. Shasson Martin want to begin to build a banking relationship so they would like your direct number. And I don't know how to provide that, but they'd like to be able to contact you or a banker at Key Bank that would be appropriate for them? Sure. So I believe some follow up information will be sent out to the participants. Um, I will make sure, Sashaw, that my information is included on there. I do believe that there is a uh, link to my LinkedIn page. You're welcome to send me a direct message and I can send you an email and we can communicate from there. Oh, okay. Good. And then, and, and, and so that, that will include other panelists as well. And uh, uh, Dan, how many of those uh, small business development centers are around the state? We have 10 centers around the state. Okay, so, so uh, wherever you are in the state, there, there is a center uh, close, close to you and take, it, Absolutely. take, advantage, take advantage of that. So, before we close today, we have 10 or 12 minutes remaining. I want to make sure we get to this. Someone is asking, uh, Shasson again, uh, about how to apply to the Restart Grant pro for Restart Grant fund funds. And so what is the next thing that Shasson needs to do in order to do that? I, I can tackle that one if you'd like. Um, the, the state of Indiana has a website that is, uh, I'll read it to you, and we can, maybe we can include this in the follow-up as well. Uh, it's a back on track altogether, so it's backontrack.in.gov. If you go to that website, you'll see the restart efforts and the state of Indiana efforts to, to get people back into the employment, get companies back on their feet. And there's a link there for the restart program. They'll go into all the qualifications. There'll be a little checklist of, you know, are you able to even apply for this? So you'll go through those five easy checks and, uh, and then the application link is right there. So again, that's back on track dot i n dot g o v
manner that everyone can take advantage of. And so I just in encourage you, that's workforce development. <clears throat> I would start, I don't have a website for you, but if you're looking for any of the workforce training grants, uh, in.gov is where I would start and then link from there to the appropriate website. Um, that's not on our agenda today, but I will tell you those grants are available. Um, let's see if we have any uh, other questions as we're closing out today. John, if I could add one thing, we, we haven't really touched on it too much, but the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program is reopened. So um, if, if you have not accessed that and you're looking at uh, a possible loan directly administered through the SBA, um, if you've been impacted by COVID, then uh, certainly you should take a look at the EIDL um, offerings and see if you qualify for those loans. So it's a 3.75% interest rate for 30 year terms and uh, can really, really be the lifeblood to, to help a business stay afloat. And I apologize. I think I answered that question wrong earlier from someone because I didn't realize it was reopened outside of agriculture. Yes, yes it had, sorry. Just recently. Got it. Because every day it changes, remember? Not every <laughs> hour, I think. <laughs> right. So John, the other thing that I would kind of add to that as we talk about resources is I would highly encourage the participants to leverage the SBA.gov. That's the best way to get up-to-date information on what's being offered through the SBA. There are forms available. How do I apply for forgiveness? What will the SBA be looking for? A lot of those uh, more technical questions that you may think of at the end of this webinar you may consider going to the SBA site. Uh, that's where I learned, in fact, where the payroll um, expense went from 75 down to 60. So as things change every hour, uh, to John and, and Dan and Michelle's point, um, that's, that's another good resource uh, as well. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ivory. Um, one more question from Carmen Alsom. How do you get the increase for the EIDL? Not quite sure I follow the increase portion of the question. You can clarify that, but if any other panelists want to attack it from several the, standpoints. The, the typical, do. yeah, the, I, I can address some of that. The typical terms would be the initial offering that's accepted. And uh, once you've signed those documents, there's there's been a clause in there where you can go back to the SBA and re request an increase. And uh, you can go back and, and within a six month window request more. Typically what's required is the subject line of an email that's their disaster relief email. You would put the, uh, the loan number or your, your account number um, in that subject line. And then the, the line would be a request for increase or you would spell it out pretty clearly so that it doesn't get lost in, those, in the shuffle of the SBA's uh, enormous volume of communications. Uh, but it's a slow process, but it's, it's a window open within six months where you can go back to the SBA and request that they reevaluate that. Granted, they're going to be looking at credit scores. They're going to be looking at the, the eligibility or your, how much can you pay back? Are you able to do this? This isn't an automatic by any means. They very well may have maxed you out at the beginning. You know? So going back and asking for more will depend upon how they evaluate you as a business and determine if, if, if you're a good risk. So, and keep in mind that the EIDL you know, process does involve collateral. It, it, it's, it's a real loan, guys. This is not, uh, you know, for the faint of heart. This is, you know, you're, you're, putting, you're putting things up on the line to get this. Carmen clarified her question, although I think Dan still has, I think Dan's answered the clarification. But, and you did a good job clarifying it, Carmen. Uh, stating, uh, asking, well, because if you are new, they give you a very small offering in the beginning. And so I think, Dan, you covered that. Um, uh, if, if there's anything you want to add to that, Dan, feel free. No, I, I think it's a matter of requesting. It, 
it's a process where you take your number and it's an email to them. There's really no way to, to talk with one of their own underwriters. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a shot. It's, it's not easy. Okay. Because Carmen, Carmen has requested the increase, but, 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 but has not heard back at all from, uh, from them. And hopefully she will at some time soon. Um, and then another question relating to EIDL from Alicia Sims, are there any ways to be relieved from repayment of EIDL? Is there a forgiveness provision? Who wants to take the no on that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is no You seem to be either. doing such an excellent job, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Okay. Unfortunately, now, now, now keep in mind, you did have, I think it was talked about earlier, the advance, which was the grant. And, uh, and that was up to $10,000, 1,000 per employee, you know, to the max there. Um, and it has its own consequences as it relates to PPP. But overall, um, that fund has dried up. So there, there are no more grants, no more advances as part of that program. And the EIDL loans are not forgivable. Currently, tomorrow, who knows? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I have, we have time for one more question. And that question is, are there specific programs for minority or women-owned businesses beyond PPP or EIDL? So I'll take that one. So I am a Key for Women certified advisor. Uh, we do have a Key for Women website. I'd be happy to provide some additional details and the resource information, but we offer webinar forums such as this where we provide additional information to specific to women-owned businesses from a resource perspective. Um, it is not my understanding that there's ever anything available specifically offered to women-owned businesses, but um, I'd highly encourage you to, to inquire perhaps and even join uh, the Key for Women organization. It does not require that you're a client of, of Key Bank, but there's definitely some really good information that we love to share with our women-owned business owners. We have webinars like this where we um, introduce you to women CEOs and CFOs, and they talk about wealth planning and strategizing, and it's, it's so much fun. And, and sometimes there's wine involved, which always makes everything more fun. <laughs> so I highly encourage you to, um, to look into our Keeper Women program. Well, are there any more uh, comments from, the, from our panelists? Just hang in there. I mean, this is a tough time for everybody. I think, you know, one of the things we all need to remind ourselves of is just to give ourselves a little bit of grace. It's, it's, this is not easy to navigate. It's nothing that any of us have ever navigated before with a global pandemic situation. So, um, you know, all you can do is do your best and, you know, cross your fingers or say some prayers and just, you know, give yourself a little bit of, of grace and a little bit of room to know that you might not always operate at hundred percent efficiency right now. And that's okay. Yeah. And I would just add, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, I think so many times as business owners, we're used to calling the shots, right? We're used to being the go-to person. Don't be afraid to be the person who has a question. Don't be afraid to raise your hand and ask for help. Um, leverage your community. Uh, Dan and Michelle have, have given some really, really good information. Don't be afraid to, to I can't emphasize that enough, to raise your hand and and, and ask for help. We're, we're all experiencing life differently than what we are used to. And um, this is an adjustment for, for everyone involved. And so uh, be a little vulnerable and, and ask, those, ask those questions when you have them. I would just conclude that what we've kind of the recurring theme here is the constant changes. So stay on your toes, be alert, don't be afraid, as Ivory just said, to ask the same question even, you know, I mean, what you got the answer yesterday is not going to necessarily be the same one tomorrow. So continue to press, stay alert, and, uh, and hopefully between all of us, you know, we'll continue to try to get information out to the small businesses. Well, with that, um, I'd like to thank 
all three of our panelists. You all have done an excellent job. You've been very helpful to, to all of the participants, including me. So I think all of the entrepreneurs have, have learned something today. And, and I wanna thank Indiana Black Expo for another excellent webinar. They had a phenomenal education conference last week. And I wanna thank KeyBank for being supportive of that uh, Indiana Black Expo's minority business series and, and, and that. And, and, uh, and thank you, Dan, for the partnership with Indiana Black Expo and, and all that you've been doing to bring opportunities to uh, small and uh, minority and women-owned businesses across the state. And it's nice to, to learn more about your business, Michelle, and uh, you know what you do, and it's a very much a, 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 a needed service. If you can't afford to have someone in house, then I say as soon as you can afford it, get you someone to keep your books uh, in a very current fashion. And uh, Ivory is going to get some contact information. Take advantage of that. If you don't have a banking relationship, get one and get you can meet with with ivory she can get you with the right person at key bank so you so that you can start a relationship there uh that said i want to thank everyone and hopefully if you have more questions join us at the august 3rd uh webinar with that said thank you and and have a good day thank you thanks everyone bye-bye thanks everyone bye-bye don't forget the survey. That survey is <laughs> going to pop up. We need that to make the August 3rd webinar even better. So please provide that feedback. <laughs>